We've been speaking on a very important theme the last few days, and that is renewal, spiritual refreshment, revival. And uh, this is very much a part of my heart and my spiritual DNA. As long as I can remember, I've been crying out to the Lord for God to pour out His Spirit in our midst. We've seen over the years uh, a great move of the Spirit in several places that God has granted me to pastor. And uh, the more I see His power and His glory, the more I long to see it. And we've been discussing these particular verses and chapters in the Bible that lead us to that place. I love that song we sang, Sister Sabo, about the fires, uh, consuming fire. Stir it up in my heart, Lord. Stir it up in my heart. And you know, I couldn't help it because I just saw word base. And as, as you were singing the word stir, I was brought to First Peter. That's not my text. So it's Second Peter. And uh, as I was reading Second, it just came to me. I just want to read this before I preach. Uh, the, this is not part of my sermon. This is for free. You can just receive this. Uh, there's no charge whatsoever. Uh, Second Peter tells us in the first chapter, he says here, In verse 11 and 12, For so all an inheritance shall be ministered unto you abundantly unto the everlasting kingdom of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present. Here's my verse. Yea, I think it meet, as long as I'm in this tabernacle, which is my body, to stir you up. By putting in remembrance to stir you up. And I trust uh, this morning we're going to be stirred up in the spirit, as the song says, and that we will draw closer to the Lord. My text this morning is found in Matthew chapter 25. If we could turn, please, to Matthew chapter 25. We'll begin at the 14th verse. Matthew 25, verse 14. Again, I want to welcome everybody. Thank you for being here. I know the weather isn't very uh, conducive, but you're here, and we give God the praise. Matthew chapter 25, verse number 14, we begin. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. To every man according to his several abilities, and straight away took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two also gained the other two. But he that had received one went and digged it in the earth and hid his Lord's money. Please underscore his Lord's money. And after a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with him. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. And his Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. And he also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents besides them. And his Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Then, then, he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid and went and hid my talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that in thine. And his Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not and gathered where I have not strawed. The word strawed means scattered. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to an exchanger. And then 
At the coming, I should have received mine own with insurance, usury. Take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And he cast ye the unprofitable servant into utter darkness, where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Father, we come before you this morning. We ask, Lord, for a divine revelation. We pray that you would open our hearts and our understanding, that we would see the words that you have spoken to us not just with our eyes, but with our hearts. And that you will draw us to your presence. And that, Lord, these words would be words of spirit and that ultimately our hearts would be stirred, not just emotionally, but that, Lord, there'd be change. That there'd be change. Renew us, Lord. Replenish, restore, and revive, we ask. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Uh, this morning, we're going to be looking at a very, very familiar portion of Scripture, the parable of the talents. We see other parables that Jesus speaks about, the fig tree, the parable of the ten virgins. And these parables are very significant because parables, if you will, are like illustrations. There are stories that Jesus gives to us as an illustration of a truth he's trying to make. Jesus is the master teacher. And Jesus is responding to two questions that were asked of him in Matthew 24. The two questions that were asked of him by his disciples go as follows. In Matthew 24, Jesus is speaking about the temple. He's on the Mount of Olives, and he tells them that the temple one day will be destroyed. He said, all these things will come down. And the disciples, as they were listening to Jesus... Ask them, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? When will be the sign of your coming, Lord? And when will be the sign of the end of the world? And Jesus proceeds in his teaching, and he actually responds to his disciples the longest answer to any question that was given him. The reason why it was the longest answer is because of the significance of this particular text and the truth that he's about to convey to us. He says... There'll be deception running to and fro throughout the earth. False prophets, wars and rumors of wars. There'll be pestilence and earthquakes and famines. There'll be all kinds of signs taking place upon the earth that will increase as a mother is about to give birth to a child and the, 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 the pain is getting stronger and stronger and more intense. We know that the child is about to be born. When these signs begin to intensify, you know that the sign of his coming is at hand. We have never seen more earthquakes than we have seen today, according to seismologists and statistics. Famines are devastating our world. False prophets, we find one almost on every street corner today. Deception is running wild. We hear of, of all kinds of, of wonders and signs, uh, 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 floods, hailstorms, unprecedented events upon the earth that we have not seen before escalating and rising. And Jesus says these things must come to pass, but they are the beginning of sorrows, the beginning of birth pangs. And as he teaches about the sign of his coming and the end of our age as we know it, he now begins to illustrate his teachings. As every good preacher, as every good teacher does, he brings his material, he brings his information, and now he illustrates it through stories or events or experiences. Before he begins with the parable of the talents, he speaks about the fig tree and he speaks about the ten virgins. And the theme of these particular stories is perpetual readiness, that you must be ready and anticipate his coming, for in such an hour which you know not, the Son of Man returns. He talked about the importance of occupying till he comes, the importance of being ready. Ready! But in this particular parable, we see a little bit of a shift. This parable speaks about the importance of working while you are waiting. The importance of being busy. The importance of occupying and not 
slothfully waiting each and every day, doing nothing in anticipation of his coming. And so the story is about action. The other stories was more about attitude, being perpetually ready. But in this particular story, it's more about being active. It's more about being ready for the coming of the Lord and being active in what he's called us to do. If you notice in verse 14 in this text, we see a story that centers around a, a huge estate. And there is the owner of this estate, and this owner is a picture of Jesus. This owner gives administrative duties to his servants. His servants is a picture of the church. And he gives uh, these servants certain responsibilities to do. For now, the owner of the estate is going on a far journey. Again, a picture of Christ. We see in John 14, he speaks to his disciples. He says, he says, I'm going away from you, but I'm going to be coming back. But I'm going away to be with my father for a period of time. Again, we see this as a picture of Jesus on this journey. And these administrative duties are given. And you notice the Bible speaks of talents. According to my research, one talent is approximately 600 denaries. And 600 denaries is approximately one day's wage during this particular time in history. And so in a sense, a talent uh, in today's terms would be approximately worth uh, half a million dollars. And so this estate owner gives a tremendous amount of money to these individuals to take care of. And the point I am suggesting and making this morning is that they were to use this money for the owner and not for themselves. I repeat, they were to use this money for the owner and not for themselves. And I think somehow, Pastor, we've got that almost confused today. Where we think that what God has given us is to be used only for ourselves. That's not true. And I'm not saying that God doesn't bless us so we can enjoy some of that blessing. Of course that's true. But that's not the primary reason. And so these servants had a mandate from the Lord. He wanted them to invest and to deal with the money as if the owner was there. He was to deal with what was given to him as if he was living with the owner. And to work diligently because you know how it is with us human beings. We're at work and if the boss is not around we kind of like uh, slack off a little bit don't we? And uh, when the boss comes back to the office, we kind of get all excited and get all, all like, you know, diligent again, start working and making sure that he knows that we're working hard. But we are to work diligently as if the owner is before us. And this is very important. And the point is that Jesus is the owner of this estate. And he's gone off to, uh, to be with his father, according to the word. But he makes it very clear that he's coming back again to receive his church. And in that period of time of his going to be with his father and coming back to receive us, there's uh, at least, we have at least 2,000 years of what scholars call the church age, in which we live in right now. But Jesus is coming back to rapture the church. And in that period of time, you and I have a responsibility. Not just the pastor, the evangelist, the prophet, the apostle. No, no. Every single person who calls himself a believer has a responsibility. When people tell me, Pastor, I don't know what my calling is. I, I get a little nervous because... Uh, then I realized very quickly this person does, doesn't really understand what his purpose in life is. See, your purpose in life will produce passion in your life. When you know your purpose, you will have passion. If you don't know your purpose, you have no passion. And there's so many believers who don't know what their purpose is. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, you and I have a purpose to be diligent in doing something while we're waiting for the coming of the Lord. And so while the owner is gone, the owner entrusts us with the affairs of his estate. Notice his estate, not our estate. Listen, folks, 
We are managers. We are not owners. People come and they say, Pastor Dino, you know, we, really, uh, we really love your church. I stopped. Excuse me. It's not my church. This is not Pastor B's church. God forbid. It'd be in trouble if it was. This is God's church. And we are simply uh, uh, just uh, taking care of the affairs. We are managing the affairs of the owner until he comes back. And so we have a responsibility to be active. We have a responsibility to be busy. You see, one day God will ask of us to give an account of how we dealt uh, with the business of our God. He did to, uh, he's, we're going to be called to give an account on how we conducted ourselves upon the earth. Because there is a day of judgment, not only for the unbelievers, but for the believers. In fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 talks about what the Greek term is the bema seat, where we will be brought before the judge, and we will be judged for our works, not for salvation. That was taken care of at the cross. When Jesus died on the cross for you and me, that judgment was taken care of. Your sin was taken care of. You are saved through Christ. But Christians will appear before the judgment seat or the bema seat that our works will be judged. And Paul calls them wood, hay, or stubble, or precious stones. And they'll be tried by fire. And if your works are made out of wood, hay, and stubble, uh, your works are going to burn in fire. Not the fires of hell, but the fires of judgment, Christian judgment. But if your works are pure and strong, they will endure the fire. They'll only become purified, gold and silver and precious stones. And these works are not necessarily judged by what is seen by the naked eye because many works that are seen by the naked eye that look very good and very holy God is weeping because he sees the condition of your heart and the motives of your heart and why you do these things so our works will be judged by the motives of our hearts because many deeds that are plotted by man God is weeping because he sees the hearts of men and that's why on that day they say but Jesus didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do this in your name? And he says, um, yeah, but I don't know you. I don't know who you are. You might look like a, a sheep, but you're, you're not. Your motives are wrong. You had an agenda. Your heart wasn't right. You never knew me. And so one day we are going to appear upon this judgment seat, the Bema seat. And the talents that God has given us, we have a responsibility to use them. And, uh, and how we use these gifts will determine and be the basis for this judgment. The Bema seat is an interesting word because in the days of Paul, in the days of Jesus, there was what they called the Ithmian Games. It was the, preceded the Olympic Games invented by the Greeks. And the Greeks had a great big fascination with athletics and sports. And the Olympic Games was very popular in the time of Jesus. It was called the Ithmian Games that evolved into the Olympic Games. And how they would run these games is there would be a judge. And, if a, and there'd be really no, no silver or gold. There was only one winner. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, says when you're running this race, you know, run not to be disqualified because there's only one winner. And back then there was just, just one prize, the winner. And we were to run the race in Christ to win that prize. And so the winner of that event, whether it be wrestling or running, running was the number one event, would be awarded this wreath called the Stephanos. Stephanos is the word we have in the English, Stephanie, the name, or Stephen, comes from Stephanos. It was a word given to the one who won, and he would approach the Bema seat, and the judge would give him this award. God calls them crowns. Revelation tells us that God is going to give us crowns as a reward of our service to him, and that we're going to cast those crowns before his feet. Even the crowns we get, we still don't keep them. We cast them at the feet of Christ anyway. Because everything comes from God and everything goes back to God. And so God will call us one day to that place of accountability. And you see, my friends, all the abilities that God has given us is so that we can invest it for His glory.
And what I want to do, I want to break it down and give a little bit of a teaching this morning. And I want to give you some principles that end with TY that will help us understand this text. The first thing I want you to understand about the talents that are given to us. Number one, these talents are given to us according to the sovereignty of God. Verse 15, the sovereignty of God. This is God's choice. I don't know why you have five talents, Pastor B, and why I have one, or why you have three. I don't know why. Is it because I'm better looking than you? No. Is it because I'm in better shape than you? No. Is it because I'm born in Nigeria? No. Is it because I'm born in Canada? No. God's sovereignty. God just cho chose to give you a certain gift. Notice verse 15. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two talents, to another one. To every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. So God gave those gifts sovereignly as he chose to certain people that he felt needed those particular giftings or can use those giftings to the best of their ability that we're going to see in a moment. Now, when you talk about ability, we have to understand that the sovereignty of God does not determine the ability you might have in the natural realm. Each has his own ability that God has given them to exercise these gifts and to perform and to do what needs to be done with these gifts in how God has given you the strength and the ability to do that. They are not earned. They're gifts. You don't earn these gifts. You can't sit back and say, God, now wait a minute. I deserve five talents because, you know, I'm such a good guy. It doesn't work that way. Nothing we have from the Lord is earned. It's all by his grace. I repeat. It's all by the grace of God, which means his empowering presence or his power. So that you and I won't be puffed up and think, oh, there's something special about me. Look how great I am. Oh, man, did you see? You know how I know why God has done this in my life? Because have you ever noticed how great I am? How good I am? How holy I am? These gifts have got nothing to do with your ability. There's nothing you have done to earn these gifts. It is strictly by the grace and sovereignty of God. Point number one. And before I get to point number two, I'd like us to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And I want to read something very powerful that will help us solidify this very, very important fact. Because a lot of people struggle in this area. We don't hear much about the teaching today of God's grace and what that means in our lives. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, I want you to see something very significant. Notice, please, we'll look at verse number We'll start with verse number 6. And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up one against another. Verse 7. For who maketh thee to differ from one another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive now if thou didst receive it why dost thou glory as if thou hast not received it what is paul saying listen what makes you different than me it's not how wonderful you are it's what god has put in you it's what god has done in your life that makes you different. whatever you have is from the lord and so i can't compare myself with you i can't say i wish i was more like pastor b or, or sister B, or, you, you, know, you know, I want to, I, I am who God has called me to be and who I am, and I got to be content in who I am, and I've got to be used the way God wants to use me. I can't sing like Pastor B, thank God, but, <laughs> but, but, I can, I can, I can do what God has given me. I had to do that because you made fun of her, and I had to get, <laughs> I, I, I stick up for you, don't worry about it, of course. <laughs> But the point is, it's God who makes us different. The point is, it's God's sovereignty that decides the amount of giftings or talents you and I are supposed to have. Amen. Number two. Then these talents were given according to the capacity of the servants. Not only because of the sovereignty, but notice number two, the capacity of these servants. We see in our text, somebody has one talent. 
Somebody has two talents, somebody has five talents. Interesting. Speaks of capacity of the individual. They are able to function. And God knew their capacity and gave them a gifting to accommodate the capacity or their ability to function. In other words, if you got five gifts, my brother, then you have the capacity to use them. If I have one gift, I can't because I don't have the giftings that he has. I cannot do what this man does. Everybody has a place in the kingdom of God. I can't, you can't do what Pastor B does, and Pastor B can't do what you do. You see, we all have a responsibility to flow together as one in the body of Christ. We all have different gifts. Sovereignly given to us by God, by the capacity that he sees in us to exercise those gifts. And then number three, notice these talents were given for the opportunity, opportunity to bring glory to the owner, to bear fruit, to bear fruit and to use it. Even the least of these servants were entrusted with at least a half a million dollars. So please don't feel sorry for these individuals, those that have one gift or one talent, you might say, according to the word of God, that is at least worth a half a million dollars. And so, we see the sovereignty, the capacity. We all have the opportunity. The opportunity is there. You can never say, I don't have a, an opportunity to use my gifts. Uh, you can never say, I don't have a gift to use. That's a lie. Everybody has at least one gift. One talent that can be used for his glory. And fourthly, not only do we see sovereignty, capacity, opportunity, but number four, these talents were given to us as a responsibility, we have a responsibility to what? To maximize what God has given us. To bear fruit. To maximize what God has given us. To maximize what God has given us. To maximize what God has given us. Blessed is he who hears the word of God and does it or maximizes it. There are too many hearers of the word and not doers only. We're not called just to hear, but to do. You see, my brothers and my sisters, this particular money was not for their own. It was for the master's purposes, and the servants had a responsibility to use the master's money for the furtherance of his kingdom. We have a responsibility to use the giftings that God has given us. What? To maximize and to further the kingdom of God. In other words, to see his kingdom go forward. Hereby is my father glorified. That ye bear much fruit. He could have said just fruit and we could have been happy with that. But he says much fruit. To, in other words, to maximize. To maximize. You see, we need to understand that we are accountable for the gifts that God has given us. And it doesn't necessarily mean money. I don't even want to talk. It's, I, it's not even really about money. It's about your heart and about your willingness to serve. That's what this is about. Your willingness to be a servant of God. And we've all been given gifts. And so we are to invest whatever God has given us for his glory. Because as pastor said here, we are not our own. We've been bought with his own blood. And you know, friends, when we realize that we are not our own, that we are bought with the blood of Christ, that we are his child, that we belong to him, that will change your perspective in life. The problem is we think we are our own. We think we live for ourselves. We, we, we've, we've embraced the philosophies of the world. Let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Most of us live just to satisfy the flesh and satisfy our lives, to live in comfort. That's not why we live. That's not why we're believers. We're not believers to make ourselves comfortable. We're not born again so we can enjoy the pleasures of this world. We're here to maximize what God has given us for his glory. And a servant serves his master. But when you are your own master, then you serve yourself. The point is, now watch this, friends. If we are all stewards, 
then nothing is truly ours. I got, I got, I got this key just flew. If we are true servants and stewards of Christ, then nothing we have is truly ours. And if that's true, why do we live in this world as if everything we have is ours? You don't believe me? Let me try to drive your car one day with a... Let me go into your house and take the keys and see what happens. No, of course I'm exaggerating, but you understand. There's a principle here. Everything we have, my brothers and my sisters, is on loan. Set not your affections on things of this world, but on things above. How many Christians have set their roots so deep into the earth? Everything's about this world and the ways of the world. We, we, we can't let go of certain things because we, we, we love those things and we hold on to those things. We need to understand that those things don't truly belong to us and that seems to be the problem today. Everything belongs to God. He owns everything. He's entrusted everything to you. You have a responsibility to maximize what God has given you. That's your calling. That's my calling. You see, my friends, the Lord is saying that I'm letting you use these things for a period of time. It's just a period of time. How you live and where you are. I think my brother said, you're in this. Did you not say earlier that there's no by accident that you're here? Didn't you say that? There's no accident you are where you are. There's no accident that you work where you work. There's no accident that you are married to who you're married. There's no accident that you are living where you're living. You see, everything has purpose. Everything has design. God's in control. He's in authority. And sometimes we don't understand it. And sometimes we think, oh, if we can change it. But God has a plan for your life. God has direction. You are where you are today, and you are where you are today for one reason, one reason only, to maximize what God has given you, to be a true servant, because one day we're going to face him, and God will ask, what did you do with the two talents I gave you? Did you use those talents for yourself? Or for me? We all have one thing in common. We might have different talents, but we all have the same amount of time. So please don't tell me you're, you don't have time. We all have time. Depends where your priorities are. Now, sometimes Jesus comes and says, you know, I, I'm going to need your car for something. Or I'm going to need your money. Or I'm going to need your house. Or I'm going to need whatever it might be. As he came to Abraham and said, Abraham, I, I, I want you to give me your son. It was a test, of course. Because sometimes God will come and test you and see where your priorities are. And he might take something from you that you value the most. Or he might cause something to happen in your life where what you are valuing very highly is now uh, going through, you're going through some, some, some trials in that particular area. And it's not a trial, and it won't be a trial if it doesn't hurt you. And if you, if you value something, and you value it maybe a little bit more than you should, and, 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 and something is happening in that particular area in your life, and you're feeling the pain of it, you're only feeling the pain of it because you value it so much. And maybe God is trying to speak to you, and maybe your loyalties are being tested. Do you love God more, or do you love this thing more, or do you love this person more? Your loyalties will be tested. And so God says to Abraham, Abraham, I know you love me, but, but you really love this son, and I've given you this son, and for 25 years you've been waiting for Isaac to be born, and finally he is born, and now your loyalty will be tested. I want you to sacrifice your son to me. Many times does God come to us and ask us to do something like that? And I've noticed in my life that he normally does these things as we draw closer to him. See, God will not share his glory with any man. I know we don't like to fully understand, perhaps we don't fully understand that. And some of these people that are full of themselves, and full, they, you might say, well, how can they continue to do what they're doing? There'll be a day of reckoning for anybody, for you, for me. And that's not my responsibility just to look at people and say, what are they? My responsibility is to do what I can for what he's given me and keep my eyes on him. So sometimes he will test your loyalties. You see, God wants full custody. Completely full custody, not just simply weekend visits. And that's what he's called us to surrender our lives to him. You see, you cannot be a true servant if you're living for yourself. 
You might say, Pastor, you live, you're talking about a life that seems pretty boring and pretty ho-hum. Absolutely not. It's when you truly surrender to Christ that you truly experience his joy. The reason why some Christians don't have joy is because they haven't surrendered their lives to Christ. They're trying to live the best of both worlds. And you can't live the best of both worlds and experience his peace or his joy. It's impossible. And so the point I'm making this morning is that while we are waiting for the Lord to come back, that's the teaching of the ten foolish virgins, uh, five foolish virgins and the five wise virgins. That's the teaching of the parable of the fig tree. While we're waiting for the Lord to come back, and we don't know when, but we are to be, we are to be perpetually ready, occupying each day. While we're waiting, I'll give you another W. We must be working. While we're waiting, we must be working. While we're waiting, we must be working. While we're waiting, we must be working. And so now I want you to notice the response of these servants because now the servant is facing his master who has returned. Notice, please, verse number 16 of chapter 25. Then he that received five talents went and traded with the same and made other five talents. And likewise, he that hath received two also gained two. But he that received one digged in the earth and hid it, the Lord's money, and after a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with him. In other words, verse 19 says, after all this time, I've given you time. I don't know when he's coming back. But when Jesus comes back to rapture the church, I believe, and according to this scripture, the day of Christian judgment will take place. There'll be seven years of tribulation upon the earth. And during those seven years of tribulation, two events will take place. Number one, Judgment seat of Christ. Number two, the marriage supper of the Lamb. When that is over, then he will come back again, called the second coming, to fight in the battle of Armageddon to destroy the works of the enemy. And for a thousand years, he'll be in bondage while we experience the millennial reign for a thousand years. And after that, the final judgment where Satan will be cast into the lake of fire with, his, with those that followed him. And we will enter into... Uh, the eternal place that God has for us called the New Jerusalem. Where we will be with him forever and ever and ever and ever. But until that time, Jesus is coming back to rapture us. And we have this time that all of us have equally. And now he's come back and now comes the judgment. And so he's going to call my wife Nadia. He's going to call me and we're going we're to stand before him. And a day of reckoning takes place. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 tells us it is appointed unto man once to die and then. Can we see that on the screen please? Hebrews 9 27. I want you to see it. In case you think there's something misguiding here. Hebrews 9 27. It is appointed unto man once to die. But after this the judgment. And so a day of reckoning takes place here. And verse number 19. And I want you to notice, two of the three servants are really excited. You see, when you're working while you're waiting, there's an excitement. The Bible tells us in 1 John 3, 3, He that hath this hope, what hope? The hope of the coming of the Lord. He that has this hope in him, what is purifieth himself. When you truly believe that the Lord is coming back, you're not going to live a life of sin. You're not going to live a life of, 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 of debauchery. You're, you're waiting for his coming. And that's propelling you to live righteously. That's propelling you to live right before the Lord. These two servants believed that the master was coming back while the other one didn't. Notice the response. They were all excited, these two. They waited for the coming of their master. As there's going to be many of us who will be excited for his coming, and some of us will not be excited. But there was one man who hid his gift, who hid his talent. We see this in verse number 18. He that received one dug it in the earth and hid it, hid his Lord's money, if you notice this. He wanted to play it safe. He said, I'm... I'm going to make sure that when my master comes back, I might at least get it back. You see, during this time, there was, there was no banks. There was no real vaults. And so they, they had to invest it in some other way. And so this man wants to play it safe. And he hides it in the ground and buries it. I'm going to hide my gift. I'm not going to use it. 
I'm not going to exercise what God has given me. I don't need to do that. I'm just going to hide. I'm going to play it safe. I'm not going to be too outspoken. After all, what are people going to think of me? I don't want people to think I'm some fanatic. So I'm just going to be quiet. I'm going to take it easy. I'm going to play it safe. I'm not going to do anything too extreme. I'll let other, these other fanatics do it. I'm just going to, I'm going to take my Christianity and, and just keep it to myself. You know, after all, you know, my religion is personal. After all, you know, my faith is, you know, it's, it's personal. I don't need to let anybody. It's just for me. Yeah. Uh, we talked a little bit about that on Friday. We called these people secret agents with God, but God doesn't have any secret agents. James Bond does not exist with God. There's no secret agents. If you're a Christian, you're called to be outspoken with the personality God's given you. I see Pastor B. He's completely opposite than I am. I look at him and I'm saying, my gosh, this man is so refined and so, you know, smooth and... And so calm, and, you know. I'm saying, wow. See, I, I'm saying, my good. But you see, God has made us differently. Hasn't he? He's made us differently. And what's important to understand is that that's not what's going to be the basis of our judgment. But what we have done with what He's given us, according to the personalities that He's given us. You can't be me, and I can't be you. I'm not going to try to be like you. Please don't try to be like me. Remember once when I started ministry, my youth pastor tried to impersonate how I preach. So he'd take the microphone, he'd put some water there, and he would dress the way I would dress, and he would use my notes, and he would use the letters of the alphabet, and, and, he, and I said, what are you doing? Well, pastor, I want, I want the anointing. I want the anointing. You think the anointing comes by trying to impersonate people? Are you kidding me? Remember in the, in the 90s, there was a very popular group called the Vineyard. It swept the land, and people, the, the revival broke out in many areas, and this music was just, and, uh, was just so popular. And, but they used to dress a certain way. They came out of Anaheim, California. Then Toronto experienced what they call the Toronto Blessing. And, they, and a lot of the musicians of that day, they would try to dress up like these musicians from the Vineyard in California. They were thinking that if we can dress like them, then maybe we'll be able to have the same kind of effect. Boy, were they sort of, boy, were they, they had a rude awakening, I'll tell you. You don't get the anointing by impersonating or trying to become like, listen, you have to get your own oil from God. What do you think the five foolish virgins did? Oh, we don't have any oil. Can you please give us some of your oil? We can't give you some of our oil. If I give you the oil, I won't have it. So many Christians are trying to buy other people's oil. You can't buy any. You have to get your own oil from the Lord. You have to have your own anointing, your own ministry. You, God has to impart in you his oil, which is a picture of the Holy Spirit. Be who you are. And be content with God and what he's given you. And so one man buried it. He was scared. He was lazy. He was fearful. His faith was not strong. And so he hides it. Many times we hide things because we're scared. We're, we're worried about what others might think. And so I want you to notice what the owner says, what Jesus says in verse 21. Watch this. The rewards are coming. And so his Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things, and I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into thy the joy of the Lord. He also that received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside thee. And his Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Uh, joy is uh, a direct parallel of a strong relationship with God. I want you to notice they all heard the same thing. They all heard the same thing, but only two received the blessing. Listen to what takes place. Watch this. Three things takes place. Three things. Number one, Jesus says, well done. What do we see? We see a commendation. A commendation. They are commended for their works. Well done. That's what I want to hear one day when this life is over. When I meet the Lord, I want to hear the words of my master say to me, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Don't you? That's my goal. It's a commendation. Well done. Not only is there a commendation, but there's a promotion. I'll make you ruler over many. You were faithful in the few things. I'll make you ruler over the many things. I'm so blessed when I see and hear ministers who 
are ministering in, a, in certain areas and it's tough and they keep persevering and 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 persevering. Their trust and faith is in God. They're not out for the accolades of men. I'm so moved by that. And Pastor telling me a story of how he started in this hotel. And I, I just, I'm just overwhelmed. I'm just so moved uh, to, to hear of stories of men of God, women of God, who are willing to persevere and trust God, are not out for any kind of career, are not out uh, uh, for any kind of selfish motives, but for pure motives. And that is to maximize what God has given them. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I'll make you ruler over more. I see commendation. I see promotion. And now we see this. We see an invitation. Enter in to the joy of the Lord. Enter. Enter in. Enter in. Enter in. Invitation. Promotion. Commendation. Those are the three things that we will hear as his servants. But some will not hear that. Not everybody in the church is born again. Not everybody that claims to be a believer are believers. And we see this again evident here in this text. Now I want you to see this is very important. Very important. You see it made no difference for those who had five or two talents. Why? They both got the same reward. Why? Because this reward is based not on, on the amount. The reward is based on faithfulness faithfulness whether you pastor 10,000 people or you pastor two people you will get the same reward if you are faithful in what God has given you do not despise the days of small beginnings Zechariah said do not despise the day of anything if God has given you something be faithful that's the lesson be faithful you see, they set out to invest their gifts and they were successful and they were true servants and both made a hundred percent gain. Hundred percent. They were active. They didn't say, oh God, look, I, why does he have this and why do I have that and, and why, I, I'm, I'm not going to bother. I'm not going to bother. I just have one talent here. How boring. How insignificant am I must be. You never see that with the one who had two talents. Just faithful. Faithfulness. 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 Now, friends, I need to pause. I'll be closing in a moment, but I need to pause here because what I want you to see, my brothers and my sisters, that true stewardship, true servanthood involves risk. It takes takes risk. A true servant of Jesus Christ will not play it safe. It takes a risk to take what God has given you to, to maximize it. It takes a risk because it, you automatically are going against the ways of the world. Don't expect to be popular if you want to maximize what God has given you. Don't expect to get the favor of people. You might be ridiculed. You might be abused even. You, you might be uh, going through a lot of persecution. It takes risks. But the man who had talent, only one, didn't take any risk, did he? He didn't want to take any risks. He didn't want to do that. He was a secret agent for God. I'll take my Christianity and keep it to myself. I don't want to be ridiculed by anybody. I don't want to do anything. So I'm going to play it safe and bury my gift. Have anybody ever heard of Tony Campolo? Anybody hear of Tony Campolo? great Christian apologist. He was a pastor as well. He's a, you know man. Tony Campolo is one of the well-known Christian apologists today. Travels all over the world. He said this. He was asked by a particular reporter, news reporter, says, you know, uh, Tony, you've done so many great things. He said, would you have changed anything? He said, yes. If I had to do it all over again, I would change one thing. He said, what is this, sir? This is a great man of God. This is a man who's done so many things, I can't even begin to tell you. He said, yes, I, I will change one thing. He said, I would take more risks in my life. What? More risk? More risks. Where are the Peters that will get out of the boat when the storms are pounding against our backs? When the clouds are dark and ominous? We make fun of Peter sometimes. We say, oh, Peter, you know, he's a... But Peter, there's only two people in the world walked on water. 
One was Jesus and one was Peter. So before we, we, we slam dunk him, before we complain about Peter, let me remind you that he was the only one who walked on water. Yes, he allowed the circumstances to bring him down, but at least my brother had enough faith to get out of the boat. Too many Christians are very comfortable in the boat. They're happy to, to ride the, the waves with Jesus. As long as they're, they're comfortable, they have their nice little home. God has not called us to be in the boat. He called us to get out of the boat, you see. Begin to walk by faith. That's what he's called you to do. But this man had no faith. You know, there's three kinds of people in the church. But one, there are what I call maintainers, just happy to maintain the status quo. There are, number two, inhibitors. They always seem to stop the move of God or they're the Pharisees of the church. They, they don't like to see any kind of change. They're, they're just no risk takers or inhibitors. But then we have the third group, which I call innovators. These are people that are getting out of the boat. These are people that are helping the pastor. These are people that are willing to go the extra mile. These are people who, who are maximizing the gifts that God has given them. You see, my friends, there's no gain if there's no risk. And so this servant was reprimanded because he hid his gift. He was doubtful. He was lazy. He was full of fear. And so they are finally summoned. And notice what he says in verse 24. Watch this now. Then he which hath received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. And the Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant. <laughs> to justify his laziness and his fearfulness, he calls his master a wicked and harsh man. He says, You are harsh. What do you mean harsh? I gave you a half a million dollars and you're calling me harsh? I blessed you with, I just told you to do what you can with what I've given you and you're calling. You see how many times we, we, we blame others to justify our lack of whatever it might be. And so this man is blaming his master for not doing what he's supposed to do. Isn't that amazing? But don't we do that sometimes? And so he buries it. He's full of fear. You know, fear will cause you to bury your gifts. God hasn't given us the spirit of fear. He hasn't called you to sit in this pew and do nothing. He's called you to get up and be involved, brothers and sisters. Don't let fear rob you. How many people are robbed because of fear, are plagued because of fear? They stay home. They stay in their pew. They don't exercise what they wanted, their giftings, because they're scared what others might think of them. They're scared of failure. And because they're scared of failure, I might as well do nothing because I'd rather do nothing than be criticized. And so I'm just going to stay put. I'm going to bury my gift because I'm fearful. Fear. Fear will destroy you. Fear will paralyze you. I'll never forget uh, when I was working with my mother. I became a Christian and I worked uh, in a store for a little while before I went to Bible college. And I met a girl while I was sharing the gospel with people right beside our store. Her name was Denise, a French-Canadian girl. And uh, I talked to her about the Lord and I noticed that she was... Um, really going through a hard time and, and I asked her and I said Denise what, what, you know I noticed you come late to what, sometimes at work and you, her eyes were very dark and she had uh, you know uh, her eyes were inflamed underneath her eyes she had bags under her eyes that were so thick and she, I, I just couldn't believe she didn't you know she looked really terrible to be honest with you and I said what's the matter with you Denise is there anything she goes yes she goes, you know for the last 17 years she said to me 17 years I've had a hard time to sleep at night I go really 17 years, I went to see doctors, and I've gone to see psychiatrists, and they give me pills, and, but, but uh, they, they don't do anything. I'm still scared of the dark. I'm scared of, of, of life. I said, well, what happened to you? She says, well, as a youth, she was a young girl. She was in her late 20s at this time. When she was a young girl, she said she saw something in her room. Her parents were involved in, in some kind of occult of practices, and, and she saw a, a demon in her room that tormented her, and from that day on, she was petrified of the night, 
petrified to sleep, and she wasn't able to function properly for 17 years. She was scared of everything. I said, Denise, you know, God loves you so much. I believe God wants to bring healing to your life, Denise. You don't have to live like that. You don't have to live in fear, being tormented day after day. I took her in the store. Where I used to pray with people. I used to go around all over the place, bringing people to Christ and bringing them into the store. And a little church took place in, in, in a little place called Place du Puy, Montreal. And I'd be praying for these individuals. And, 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 and I brought her into the store and, and I laid hands on her. And we prayed. Together. I said, Denise, can I please pray for you? She goes, yes, she received Christ that day. And I prayed that God would deliver her from this fear. We came against the enemy. Next day, next day, next day, I see Denise in the store and she runs to me. She's running to me. She goes, Dino, and I saw something. She goes, Dino, Dino. When you prayed for me, she said, last night was the first night I slept well in 17 years. Let me tell you something, brothers. If you didn't sleep well for 17 years and after 17 years you're able to sleep like a baby, you'd be running wherever you need to run and giving God the praise, trust me. Not giving us the spirit of fear. Don't let your fear rob you from doing what God has called you to do. And so what do we learn as we close tonight? What, do we, what is the application of these stories? What is Jesus saying to us here at King's Court in the month of November as it's snowing so beautifully outside? I'm going to give you some F's as we close in application number one. Freely you've received, freely you must give. Stop hoarding. Give it. Freely he's given you. Freely you must give. What you do with what you have is so important. And what you do with what you have will be the basis of your judgment. However small or however big. What you do with what you have will be the basis of your judgment. Whether it be big or whether it be small. And don't assess what you're doing by what you have. What you have may not be as big as that brother or small, but that's irrelevant. You do with what you have regardless. Regardless, that's what God has given you. Stop comparing yourselves with other people. Just be content in Christ and what he's given you. Because that person that you think has a lot may not receive what you get because your reward will be based on faithfulness. I'll never forget as a little boy, I was just maybe six years old. My parents came from Greece. We were very poor. I slept on a mattress about two inches thick on the floor. That's all I had. We didn't have much. I had no toys. I, very poor. We just came from Greece. My father didn't have a job at the time. He eventually found a job. We started to live a little better, but, but during those days, it was terrible. And I used to love hockey, and I used to see some kids playing hockey, but because I wasn't connected with the in crowd, they didn't let me play. And so I would be watching this on the outsides, and I'd find a, a broken hockey stick, and I would practice, and I didn't have a ball or a puck, and I would just be using rocks and, and frozen dog manure as my, as my ball to play. That was my, my, uh, my roots in, 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 in hockey. And finally, uh, my parents had a little bit of money, but not much at all. And they finally bought me some skates. These skates were the cheapest and the most inexpensive skate. They were made out of out of out of out of cardboard. Really, it was a hard cardboard. It was, it was the, the worst skates you can you possibly buy. The blade wasn't even done properly, and the hockey stick I had was basically, you know, a broken one. It wasn't even one you can use properly. And I say that to say this: that's all I had, folks. But I'm going to tell you something: with a broken stick and the cheapest skates that money can buy, that can hardly support your ankles. I scored the most goals on my team, and I was the only player on that team that was scouted to play into another level the year next. Why? Because it's not about your stick. It's not about your skates. It's not about how this, and it's not about how that. It's what you do with what you have that will determine your blessings. David, all he had was one stone, but he took down Goliath. Number two, what do we learn from this story? We're called to be fervent. We as servants are called to be fervent in spirit, to be active, to be diligent. 
The Bible says, be fervent in spirit. Romans chapter 12. The word fervent in the Greek means to be aglow, to be on fire. God is calling us to be fervent, to be active, to be doers. Whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord. Colossians chapter 3. James says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. David said, enlarge my heart, Lord, that I might run unto thee. Enlarge my heart that I might run unto thee. Daniel said, they that know their God shall be strong. Which speaks of energy and fervency and do great exploits. And number three, my last point. Freely you give, freely. You've received freely, you must give. Second point, God's called us to be fervent, to be active. And number three, our judgment will be based not on the amount of talents, but our faithfulness in using what he's given us. 1 Corinthians 4 tells us, that a servant is required to be faithful. The requirement of a servant is to be faithful. That's my requirement. Faithfulness here in the Greek is a word that we use called loyalty. God is calling us to be loyal to him. That's what faithfulness means. Loyalty. We're loyal to him. Faithful. And it's on that basis, my friends, that we will hear the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. He could have said, well done, thou good and energetic person. Well done, thou good administrative person. Well done, thou good and, and a great voice and what a voice person. And well great done, you great preacher person. He didn't say that. Well done, thou good and faithful. Are you faithful? I've preached a long time and I'm going to close with this true story. A true story that I heard a while ago that really touched my life. There was a man many years ago who owned a company. And it was time to resign and he wanted to appoint a new CEO of this company. So he selected three men who he felt were, were qualified to some degree. But strangely, what he did is that he gave these three men seeds. And he gave them three months to plant these seeds and later come back. And he wanted to see uh, a wonderful plant that came forth from the seeds that he gave them. Can you imagine being interviewed like that? It was the last time you were interviewed and the boss gave you some seeds. Three, some seeds. Here's your pot. Plant these seeds. Come back in three months. And we will assess and make the decision of who I want to be the next CEO. Very interesting. Well, during this time, one man, we'll call him Jim, he kept watering this plant, he, seeded, he put the seeds in, in this pot, but he, he discovered that as the more he watered, the, 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 no seeds were growing, no plant, it was just, just waterlogged, nothing was happening. Week after week after week, his wife said to him, Jim, look, Jim, things aren't working out, maybe you should go and buy some seeds and, and just plant them into this pot. You know, the, 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 he's the, the boss is going to notice that something is wrong. Uh, but Jim said, no, 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 I'm just going to do the right thing. I'm just going to keep watering this, this, this pot and I'm just going to trust that somehow something will happen. I don't know, but I'm just going to trust, I'm going to trust him. Well, three months had passed and it was time to meet the president. And so they faced the president, three men. Two of the three men had a beautiful flowery plant, gorgeous plant. But the president doesn't go and speak to those two men. He makes a beeline for the man who had an empty pot. We'll call him Jim. Jim, come and see me, please. You two men sit down here. I want to talk to Jim. And these two men thought that he was going to be reprimanded. Come on, Jim. Come on. Takes Jim into his office. Jim is scared. He's saying, oh, what did I do? He says, I did a terrible job. Well, the boss looked at Jim, pulled him aside, as I mentioned, and he said this. He said, Jim, I like you. Why? You see, Jim, what you don't know and what the other two men don't know is that I gave you seeds. Yes, I know. But what you don't know, Jim, is I boiled those seeds. You see, Jim, the seeds I gave you and your two co uh, uh, friends 
were seeds that could never grow. These seeds, you could water them until the cows come home and they would never bring any fruit because these seeds could not produce any leaves, any plants. They were dead. But you see, Jim, you could have done what the other two men had done, which was go to the store, buy seeds and plant them. But you did not do that. And I ask you, Jim, why didn't you do that? Well, because I, I just wanted to be true to what you gave me. He said, exactly, Jim. He brought in his committee, he brought in the board members, and he sat them down, and he says, my brothers and my sisters, I want to present to you today the next CEO of this company. But sir, why? Because he is faithful. And I can trust someone who is faithful, someone who is loyal. You see, friends, that's going to be the basis of our judgment. Well done, thou good and faithful person, person of integrity, person of character. That's what's important to God. Amen. Let's all stand together, please.